of the internet and mobile phones actually pushes countries in the direction of more responsive. He, he, he also says, and you can see that the, the, the effect is not dramatic, it is, it is slight over that data set. The green arrow shows the direction of the average of the points. But the other thing Howard said is almost more important. It gets back to the Catholic Church trying to burn the English Bibles. There are no examples of autocracies becoming more successfully autocratic after the internet and mobile phones penetrate society, which is to say, whatever the advantages of censorship, propaganda, and surveillance afforded by these tools, and they are significant, as we know from the Sudanese case, among others, even with those capabilities, there are no examples of autocracies becoming more successfully resistant to citizen pressure. So censorship, surveillance, propaganda help compensate for increased communicative freedom, but they don't actually reverse it. And this leads to something that widely called the dictator's dilemma. Here's a little example of the dictator's dilemma at work. Uh, 2006, somebody, went to, somebody in Bahrain went to Google Earth. And they just took Google Earth images of Bahrain and then they annotated it in blistering terms. Oh, look, what's over here? It's the presidential palace. And what's behind this wall? It's an F1 racetrack. Here's a public park. And the law says that the public park is for the public. But we can see that a palace has been built here. And so on. 42-page PDF document, widely circulated, of great interest to the people of Bahrain, as you might expect. So what did the Bahraini government do? And they said, what is this Google Earth thing? We didn't, we didn't order this up. Shut it down. <laughs> down goes the spigot. What's the next thing that happens? Suddenly, everyone in Bahrain knows what Google Earth is. <laughs> so then they have to go and turn it back on, because turning it off created more trouble. In the OECD, in the G20 now, and everywhere in the developing world in five years, you will not even be able to be part of the modern economy without a cell phone in the pocket of every working citizen. Many of those phones will have cameras. And, as we've seen from events in the Middle East now, the old idea that the internet was over here, whereas mobile phones were over there, is done. And I don't mean because someday everybody in Sierra Leone is going to have an iPhone. I mean it's done now, with SMS being able to be rebroadcast, with photos being able to be rebroadcast, with video being able to be rebroadcast. It is an internet, not a transnet, which is to say it's the network of all connected networks. And the ability of people to use their mobile phones to plug in is an increasing part of, this, of the political action. So, Bahrain ran into the dictator's dilemma, which is they had to allow access to these tools because they needed this connectivity for their economy and increasingly just for their cultural life. And yet they couldn't selectively shut it down in the way they wanted to without creating more trouble as well. And this doesn't mean you can't shut things down altogether. As we know, two days after the protests started in Egypt, it went completely off the net. And engineers were scrambling, trying to figure out how could this have happened. It's supposed to interpret censorship as damage and route around it. Not a lot of routing around going on here. And it turns out they just sent guys with guns into every IXP. It wasn't actually a technical attack. They just went in and threatened people until they shut it off. And then what happened? It made the protesters angry. Right? More people turned out in Tahrir Square after they shut off the internet. So, dictator's dilemma again. Why didn't Egypt shut off the internet early? Because if they shut off the internet every time they thought that people were unhappy with Mubarak's rule, it would have been off for the last 15 years. You can't, you can't preemptively shut down the network because you can't be plugged into the modern economy if you do, and you also often can't react quickly enough. And as Bahrain discovers, sometimes when you shut it down, you make matters worse. So this, this is the dictator's dilemma. This is effectively the end state of connectivity.
which is it provides citizens with increased power, <coughs> synchronized, coordinated document, and the compensating counterpowers of the state, surveillance, propaganda, uh, censorship, are only, are only partially compensated. So, does it South by it? Because we're not just here to understand what happened. Obvious question. If we want to see more responsive government throughout the world, what do? What, what next? So here's two things not to do. Low orbit ion cannon attacks. This is the anonymous model of uh, DDoS. Uh, whatever you think of the politics of DDoS and commercial services, as with PayPal, MasterCard, uh, Visa, after the WikiLeaks, after WikiLeaks was cut off from financial transactions, DDoS attacks do not have much effect on the political environment. And so, for all the excitement of thinking, here is this theater of collapse, people are turning out in the street, I'm going to help too. That's not actually doing much, right? Because whether or not these, these insurgencies turn into revolutions has much more to do with the long game than the short game. The other thing not to do, and we, we all did it, I, I, I did it as much as anybody, is to retweet open proxies, right? So that people can find out when the open prox where the open proxies are. Because in 2009, it was just barely conceivable that the Iranian government wasn't paying attention to Twitter. It was wrong but it was barely conceived. But just a few days ago, when they were, they were going through the state security files in Egypt, someone found a file with her Twitter handle name on it. They didn't know who she was, but they were watching her so closely that they were tracking her Twitter name. So there really isn't a way when the fighting breaks out for us to be able to jump in uh, and in any kind of obvious public way to affect, uh, to affect things in the direction of more responsive government. So what can we do instead? A lot of what we can do is about the long game. A lot of what we can do is about getting involved in low-level ways over long periods rather than rushing to kind of weekend warrior models like this. And one thing we can do is we can pay attention. Pick a country you care about and just start uh, most valuable players, my, my bid for, for MVPs on Twitter in terms of paying attention, uh, Amira Al Husseini, just Amira uh, in Bahrain, uh, Andy Carver uh, in Washington, D.C., who knew enough people in the region in advance that they had some sense of what to retreat and what not. During the events in Tunisia and, and Egypt, at least the height, the height of the events in Egypt, uh, Tunisia and Egypt, Carvin was retweeting 500 times a day for three weeks in a row. And as you can see from his stream, he tweets almost nothing himself. He's just set up, as just Amira did, as someone who, because they know enough about the region, can broker these kinds. The response from the people who are skeptical of, of political effects of these media is, well, what what possible effect could the Twittering masses have? One of the interesting things about the people who don't think the internet can have a political effect is they use the names of American internet companies much more than we do. Right? So they're, they're much more concerned about headlines like Twitter revolution, Facebook revolution, rather than thinking about social media as, as a whole. Because when you frame it not as a question about Twitter or Facebook, but as a question about media, and you ask, are those governments really concerned about media? The answer is not just yes, but obviously yes. At the Libyan, at the point where you can cross at the Mediterranean from Libya into Egypt, they were letting, the Libyan government was letting people, letting people through, but they were confiscating phones and USB sticks because they didn't want the information out. The best reason to think that these tools affect insurgents in their fight with autocrats is that both insurgents and autocrats believe that, and they are willing to expend incredible resources to try and control the information. And here is why. Right? We start to see things like potential documentation that the Yemenis were using nerve gas when they came out to attack their protests. And how is that documented? How, how is that documentation created? It's created on camera phones, and it's accompanied with tweets. 
So the question isn't about a particular um, internet company, yes or no. The question is, is the state worried about media? And the answer is yes. So one thing we can all do is pay attention. Another thing we can do is volunteer. We have the ability now to volunteer remotely. The uh, Egyptian Linux users group turned out to also be a hotbed of revolutionary fervor. Right? Many of the members of that group were, because they were biased towards open source and transparency in their technical lives, were biased towards those virtues in their political lives as well. Pick a country, find the user group right, that, that is doing anything you know of, and, and talk to them remotely. Go there if you can, translate if you can. But even if not, right, we can still strike up these conversations. The people who wrote Mushahidi, the, the, the crisis mapping tool, a year ago, in fact, a year to the day ago, on March 11th of 2010, started something called the iHub in Nairobi that is, that is just a tech hub for interested tenants. Right? We can find this. We can volunteer. The UN has opened itself up right, at, at long last after having observed these kinds of effects. The UN has said, this crisis mapping thing is actually working. We need people to do things like validate uh, whether reports are real, to do analysis. If you have data analytics skills, if you have information visualization skills, the UN has a place for you to volunteer. Uh, if you want to put GPS coordinates on things, right, you can sign up for this work. And this is part of the long game. This isn't just, what can I do right now? But what can I do to build up the, 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 the stability of civil society that, in a way that makes political change more valuable? You can volunteer for technical projects. Radio Freenet is an attempt to take relatively low-level radio protocols and turn it into a shortwave internet. Relatively low bandwidth, but hard to shut down. Uptime turns out to be really good in, in these kinds of situations, both for coordination of the insurgency, but also, frankly, for identifying uh, places where people are injured or need help. Right? Ushihi, same thing. Ushahidi is a volunteer effort. There's, there's a ton of development work still to be done. Right? And I say this not just because I, some of these projects are going to succeed and need help, but also because some of these projects are going to fail, and it would be good if they were to fail faster. The Haystack debacle of last year, in which a developer convinced people, uh, including uh, the Guardian that gave him an award and the State Department that was, that was potentially funding him, convinced people uh, that there was a secure model for information transfer that could be used inside Iran, and it fell completely apart over the space of about five days when people with serious technical talents looked at it. So one of the reasons, if you have the technical skills to, to volunteer for these kinds of projects, is to help see whether or not they're going to work, because the worst thing that can happen is this which is that a project purports to be able to work, comes this close to a real world launch, uh, and then turns out to be, turns out to be small. And finally, and this is, this is a personal observation, finally we can do this. Of all the photos that came out of Tunisia and Egypt, uh, this is the one that uh, still, makes me, still makes me tear up when I see it. This is Coptic Christians joining hands to protect Muslims at prayer in Tahrir Square so that the Muslims won't be attacked. It's, yeah, it's, right. if, you, if you want that moment that makes you feel optimistic about our species, this is the photo that does it for me. Uh, we could do that. We could do that in this country. There is a wave of anti-Muslim sentiment building up. Uh, just yesterday, Representative King's hearings on Muslim radicalism in the House uh, looked to my eye like anti-Muslim grandstanding. And we, and we can do this. Christians, Jews, atheists, Hindus, Buddhists, everybody could join hands around the Muslims in this country. Because all politics is local. And if we want the U.S. to be more responsive, to events in the Middle East and North Africa. The way to do that is to build a constituency here, 
that the message from the U.S. is we will tolerate anti-Muslim sentiment on our home soil, there's really no hope for leverage uh, for U.S. policy in those countries. So these tools matter. They, are, uh, they, they mark a dramatic change from the previous media environment, and they are turning out to matter in political ways. Uh, I wish that there were low-cost, rapid ways to adopt them uh, that essentially bypass the long process of building up political capital, but there doesn't seem to be. In fact, the evidence we're getting from both the successful and failed uprisings in the Middle East um, is that if you really want to help, you'll find some way to join the long game. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to ask what you think about Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Karen Armstrong's The Charter for Compassion, which is actually taking all of the world's leaders and bringing them together to sign the charter. And actually, in Seattle, we've ratified it and made it part of our system of governance. So, yeah, the, the, so the, question, the question is about the Charter for Compassion. Uh, so I'm of two minds about those kinds of things because they are uh, they're interesting and potentially useful. On the other hand, almost every nation in the world has ratified the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so I think the real question with signing things like that is whether or not they'll give people any moral suasion. And that, that I think, is what to both push for and watch out for, is it's not just that there are signatories to the Charter on Compassion, but are people holding, are people holding the, 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 the signatories of the Charter to that, or are they going after people who aren't signatories, countries that aren't signatories, and, uh, and asking them to sign it? But really, without the moral suasion piece, the charter is just, it can be as much of a feel-good uh, exercise, alas, as, as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is, as we know, uh, more often breached than observed. Yes? Hey, Clay, uh, nice uh, talk. Um, you. you might have heard Freak Sakara was in Austin earlier this week and said, uh, when historians look back at America, they'll say that America helped globalize the world, but forgot to globalize itself. And uh, I was curious your reaction to that. If you agree, and if so, what can you do? I do, and I think, um, and I think that there's two different different things going on there. First of all, we have been so preeminent uh, on so many dimensions for so long that we got used to it. And so that was just, that's just a baseline, and then. Uh, we don't even understand what the competition looks like in terms of innovation and uh, the other countries of the world essentially not becoming, uh, you know, we, we can no longer count on them uh, to comfortably play second fiddle in our place in the world stage. And both of those are uncomfortable thoughts for a lot of Americans, but I think they're both, they're both true. And I think nobody's, nobody's been better than Farida at, at chronicling that. Um, Ethan Zuckerman, who runs the Amazing Global Voices Project, among other things, uh, is, working, is working on a book on xenophilia, essentially the voluntary turning outward and seeing what other societies or other cultures are like. And essentially what I'm advocating here is that if you want to get involved, it's not about the quick stuff you can do when the theater collapse starts. It's about the long-term stuff about getting to know people in other countries. Uh, I'm not sure how wide that effect will be. It may just be, you know, the latte swilling technical elite that adopts this. But it would be a good, I think it would be a good idea for the U.S. to be more global. Um, my fear is that, as with the anti-Muslim panic and so forth, that we may be entering a period in which we actually retreat from the world, uh, which, would, which I, I am afraid would make the effects Farid is talking about worse. But, but I think he's absolutely correct in his diagnosis. Um, I can see things we can do around it. I wish I was more optimistic than I am that, that we'll do it. Yes, yes, sir. One of the latest projects coming out from social media in Egypt is something called Pigipedia, which uses photographs that they are collecting now to identify uh, all the members of the state security system. Uh -huh. And I think this audience should know that this afternoon, one of the main Photographers that put out three CDs full of photographs on Flickr announced that Flickr just 
removed all those pictures. Completely unacceptable. Absolutely. You know, YouTube, um, I, I spent some time talking to people at YouTube who, who, who wrestle with this because very violent videos were going up on YouTube and they generally take those down. YouTube reacted fantastically well. Within 48 hours, we found a solution. It was right, done. Right. And, 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 and YouTube, once they understood the political context, put them back. Sure. What I wonder is, did Yahoo understand the political context of those photos? Do you I don't know? know, but it's completely unacceptable. I know. I mean, no, I know. Clearly, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm now thinking this also happened to YouTube, and they fixed it. I'm wondering if there's something we could say to Yahoo. But I, I don't know if Andy Carvin is in the room, but you should talk to him. I'll, I'll check. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. One more. Yes, sir. Related question. Hillary Clinton has begun speaking about social media as a basic human right. Predictions on China, three, five years out? Yeah, China, China's interesting. Um, so the thing Philip Howard says in Digital Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy is basically when your citizens get hold of these tools, they can successfully pressure, they can, they, 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 they start to be able to bring pressure on the government. And the one exception is uh, if the country has enough oil to basically be able to buy its way out of, uh, to buy its way out of having to be responsive. What China and to some degree Singapore are doing is trying to have a human capital-based economy that works in roughly the same way, which is to say they generate enough growth that uh, people won't concentrate on the political issues because the economic issues are solved. And although in the US we treat politics and economics different, yeah, as different things, we forget that our own revolution actually wasn't about freedom of the press. It was about throwing tea overboard into the Boston Harbor. Our, our political revolution was economic too. So, so what I'll say is this. What I think the Chinese are going to suffer from is not uh, edge case uprisings, the, the Uyghurs, the Tibetans at the edges of the empire, but uh, radicalized Han middle class, radicalized middle class from the, from the main ethnic group in China, uh, that understand that corruption has become such a dead weight on the economy that they are increasingly, uh, increasingly public about protest. You saw this after the 2008 earthquake in Sichuan where the school buildings collapsed. And the bereaved parents who, having lost their only child, lost their entire next generation because of the one child policy, uh, became radicalized. They weren't political actors until the school buildings came down. And it was the first significant protest China faced that was essentially homegrown and not from an aggrieved minority. I think more of that is going to happen. Uh, and China thinks more of that is going to happen. If you want to see how worried they are, Google, China is not the Middle East. It is, a, it is an English language translation of something that appeared in the Xinhua News Agency either yesterday or the day before, in which they say, essentially, China is not the Middle East so many times that you can tell that what they're worried about is that that's wrong. Uh, so they, they, when, when the events in Egypt went down, actually even when the events in Tunisia went down, uh,